Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Alan Dershowitz, a noted trial lawyer, also professor emeritus at Harvard. And Alan, um, I'm reminded of the fact that you are an author, not just of Get Trump, but also the case for moral clarity, which was very much about the current situation with Israel and Hamas. Let's start there. Do you feel like we've demonstrated moral clarity in terms of how we're viewing this conflict? No, what we're doing is we're just encouraging a repetition over and over and over again. Back in 2013, in my book on moral clarity, I predicted that the Hamas would continue to use what it calls the CNN strategy and what I call the dead baby strategy. That is, it will attack Israel, kill many civilians, and uh, Israel will retaliate. And in the process, because Hamas uses human shields, some um, Palestinian children will die. And then they'll parade those babies in front of CNN cameras. And uh, the world will attack Israel and condemn Israel. And then and Hamas will have been the victor. So Hamas starts it. And then because of the way it controls the cycle, it continues and it will continue again. And if the CNN strategy continues, if the world just looks at these tragically killed children and, and, and innocent people in Gaza and doesn't realize that they're all the fault of Hamas, that Hamas uses them as human shields, one of the former heads of Hamas said, and I got a, a recording of it, and I quote it in the book, um, we in Hamas specialize in death. Our children, our old women, uh, our invalids, and that's why we use them as human shields, just the way you love life, we love death. And so this is a tactic, a strategy you'd think that the media would understand it and not fall for it, but they become complicit in it. And I guarantee you, unless something relatively dramatic is done, this will happen again and again and again. The only thing different this time is it was much worse. In previous times, it was retail killing, um, a Jew here and there, a house here and there, a school here and there. This time it was, what, 1,400 uh, well, children, women, the indolent, all killed as part of this Hamas strategy, and they're being rewarded for it on college campuses, in uh, the media and uh, other places that ought to know better. Let, let me ask about the administration, because the Biden administration has come out with very strong support for Israel, you know, in this war, obviously they're trying to contain the casualties as, as well in terms of their counsel to our allies. Um, do you feel that's been an adequate response? Yes, I do. I think the Biden administration and uh, Tony Blinken, their response has been uh, very good. Um, and I agree, by the way, that if Israel can accomplish a good part of its goals without um, engaging in a ground war in which thousands of civilians and hundreds, maybe thousands of Israeli soldiers will be killed, it would be better. It would be better to maintain the attack from the air and from the sea. Um, and uh, But there will be casualties. There will be civilian casualties on Gaza's side. The world must understand that when Gaza declared war in Israel by killing 1,400 people, it basically said to its people, you're going to die uh, in, in, in the responses, and we know that, and we're willing to accept it. So if the world only understood, and I think it does understand, but if it reacted by saying all of this is the fault of Hamas, this never would have happened if Hamas hadn't uh, invaded Israel and killed all these people. And Israel's response is proportionate and it's uh, reasonable and the administration generally supports it. We all hope that fewer civilians are killed and fewer Israeli soldiers are killed. I don't care how many Hamas soldiers are killed, the more the better. But uh, the innocents should be spared. And uh, I think the American administration has generally taken the right approach. And it also has said, we're not gonna dictate Israel uh, how it conducts this war, though it, as a good friend, cautions about the possibility of the war getting wide if there's ground war. Also, the focus ought to be on the hostages. Apparently, another two were released. It's going to be dribs and drabs, but if the uh, Hamas has 220 hostages, they can play them like poker chips and just uh, use them um, to uh, dictate delays and uh, eventually um, that's not going to be able to be kept up. Uh, and so hard decisions will have to be made about the hostage. For example, uh, Israel has the right and the obligation to bomb the Hamas tunnels. 
Uh, they are war tunnels um, and they're populated by Hamas leaders and Hamas uh, terrorists. But there are probably some hostages in them as well. And that makes the decision whether to bomb the tunnels uh, much more difficult. But it's Israel's decision because the hostages are Israeli citizens for the most part. Um, Qatar obviously has played a critical role partly in the release of you know some of the hostages. Also, it has a direct yeah. line to Hamas. Um, they've been a U.S. ally, ally excuse me. Uh, how to deal with Qatar at this point, or is it continue to be yeah. a strong ally? Well, I know the Emir of Qatar. I've uh, uh, met with him in Qatar. I met with his brother. I met with his mother. I met with uh, the whole family. I then had dinner with him in um, in the United States. Um, try to persuade him uh, not to in any way oppose the uh, Abraham Accords and the peace process that was going forward. Um, I have a good relationship with him. He invited me to come to the World Cup. I didn't come, but uh, I have a good relationship with him. He's a very, very smart man, and he plays both sides against the middle. And uh, that's that's a valuable but dangerous um, line to try to straddle. And uh, how long he'll be able to do it, I don't know. Ultimately, he will upset some people on the Hamas side uh, if he goes too much in favor of Israel and the United States, and he'll upset the United States if he goes too much in favor of Hamas. So thus far, he's managed to maintain uh, a, a balance that keeps him viable and important as a negotiator, and let's hope he can help effectuate the release of uh, all the hostages. Um, what is the future of Hamas at this point, given um, the role that it has played in Gaza? Do you think that there is any scenario in which we can truly extricate them from the Gaza Strip? The tragedy is that the people of Gaza um, have not revolted against Hamas. Hamas is the Palestinians' worst enemy. Um, when um, Israel ended its occupation in 2005, 6 of uh, the Gaza Strip and all the money poured in, they could have used it to create a new Singapore on the Mediterranean. But then Hamas took over in a bloody coup and killed the Palestinian Authority leaders and exiled the rest of them and uh, created this horrible place in Gaza that could have been a wonderful place. It's all, all, all Hamas's fault. And you'd think the people of Gaza would understand that. But apparently, a very substantial number of the citizens of Gaza, the adults, you can't blame the children. But by the way, you're not a child if you're 15 and 16 and 17 and you're uh, uh, aiming guns or rockets at Israel. So let's understand what we mean by child. But a six-year-old or a seven-year-old can't be held responsible. But the people who still support Hamas, who voted for it in the last election, who would vote for it today if there were another election, even though it has created poverty, lack of education, lack of jobs, lack of, of, of other resources, uh, in the interest of trying to destroy Israel, you'd think the people of the Gaza would not be satisfied with Hamas leadership, but apparently they are, and they bear some moral, if not legal, culpability for what Hamas is doing if they simply tolerate it. Now, some of them can't do anything because Hamas um, will kill dissenters, but there are others who probably could um, play at least a, a more positive uh, role, but they, they haven't been. And so I think Hamas has to be destroyed militarily in much the way ISIS and Al-Qaeda were were destroyed. Now, it's not going to be easy to do, particularly in light of the hostages. Well, I mean, I, I just, uh, before we move on from that, I do recall having lived in Northern Ireland as a kid, you know, what radicalizes you is, is who's bringing in the bombs. And you don't always, I agree with you as to sort of why Israel is bombing Gaza right now, but you can see how easy it would be for the people to be casting blame to Israel in that uh -huh. situation, so. I do, but history points in different directions. Um, when Japan was devastated by two nuclear bombs, the firebombing of Tokyo, um, within two or three years, the Japanese people loved the United States. There was a, a military occupation, uh, but within 10 or 15 years, uh, Japan became one of America's greatest allies. Yep. The same thing with Germany. Uh, the United States devastated, and Great Britain devastated Germany. And then the Germans had a reckoning with their past, and they realized that their interests lie with the West. And so, no, I don't believe that uh, necessarily 
that uh, a, a total victory necessarily creates the kind of enmity that has been yeah. created among Arabs. And both of which those situations, obviously, financial investment in building up those right. societies was very critical. Let me switch back to the U.S. for a second with regard to the student protests on campuses. Um, we've not seen the Biden administration take a strong stance on that. Um, is that understandable in this situation? No. No, no, that's been a moral failure, a failure of leadership. Let's put Harvard in context for a second. In the 1930s, Harvard student groups adored Hitler. Pictures of Hitler were in the dormitories. There were clubs that supported Hitler in Nazi Germany. Uh, the Harvard administration welcomed the Nazi boat with a swastika, honored the people, uh, gave honors to uh, Nazis, sent a mission to a university, the Heidelberg University, to celebrate its anniversary shortly after Heidelberg banned all of its Jewish um, uh, faculty members. So Harvard has had a history of, of being on the wrong side, of anti-Semitism, uh, going back uh, more than 100 years. So it doesn't surprise me that today's Harvard students are the new Nazis. Um, they were, while heads were being cut off, while women were being raped, they, these Nazis were putting the blame completely on Israel. Uh, can you imagine if the same group of students had tried to put the blame on lynchings in the South, on uh, African Americans, or shootings in gay bar, on the lifestyle of, of gay Americans, or rapes uh, were the fault of the women who were raped? The school wouldn't tolerate it. Uh, the school would not say freedom of speech, freedom of expression. I believe in freedom of speech if you're going to be neutral. But if you're going to take it, if you're going to take a, a position on George Floyd, which almost every university did, one person please take a position on 1,300 innocent babies and children uh, being, uh, being viciously murdered. You can't have selective uh, morality and selective uh, condemnation. And so I think the administrations have failed. I think the uh, Biden administration has not done enough to condemn these students. And, um, and too many students uh, have supported um, uh, the, the Nazi regime uh, in in uh, in Gaza, because that's what it is. Can, it's a Nazi regime. Can I ask, Keith, since you taught at Harvard for many years, did you detect anti-Semitism among the student body since you've had a long history there yourself in terms of your inter own, own interactions? I would say it increased tremendously um, when Harvard began to adopt what's called intersectionality and the reckonings and taking more students um, from, uh, from the hard, hard left, um, uh, I saw it increasing. There was a golden period. Um, when I first came to Harvard, there was still plenty of anti-Semitism in 1964. You couldn't be a dean or president of the university if you were Jewish. Um, before that, there were quotas, both on the students and the faculty. Uh, but then when between 1964 and say the beginning of the 20th century, no, I didn't detect much, but starting in the beginning of the 21st century, it was uh, emerging. It was emerging uh, in the uh, among radical students um, and minority students, and uh, uh, tragically, gay students. You know, you have these gays against Israel. Uh, can you imagine them trying to protest in Gaza? They they had their heads cut off. But some of these stupid, stupid people, uh, gays against Israel. What do you think happens to the gays in the West Bank? Um, they escape to Israel. And they live there because Israel is a tolerant society where gays have equal yeah. rights. But in the West Bank and Gaza, they have only one right, the right to be murdered. Um, you know, I, I want to ask a little bit about how, like, we've seen certain members of Congress, I th Rashida uh, Tlaib comes to mind, how to deal with that particular contingent, obviously voted in, you can get voted out. Is there anything sure. else that should be done, just given some of the rhetoric that you're hearing there? Well. Again, remember, there were members of Congress, members of the Senate back in the 30s and 40s. Um, one of them said, don't let in Jewish babies. They're cute now, but they'll grow up to be big, ugly Jews like the rest of them. This was on the floor of the United States Congress. So we've had bigotry. We've had anti-black bigotry. We've had anti-gay bigotry. And we have anti-Semitic bigotry on the floor of the House of Representatives. And uh, um, it will be coming to the Senate before long, I, I assure you. But um, the remedy is to run people against them in the primaries, uh, vote against them in the general elections. Let me tell you, I'm a liberal Democrat. 
I will vote for any Republican who runs or, or finance, help contribute to any Republican who runs against uh, the squad. Um, and, um, and I think more people should do that. Uh, it should become the goal of decent people of any party and any religion to defeat the squad. But, you know, we're a democracy. And in a democracy, you let people speak and you let people say what they want on the floor of the Senate. But, but Ilan Omer uh, is a bigot and an anti-Semite. There's no other way of describing her. I do feel like pivoting to Trump at this point because obviously we're in the heat of an election cycle. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, what are you hearing from the Republicans? I mean, there's there's obviously great concern. There's been discussion of foreign policy among candidates like Nikki Haley. Can you give me some sense as to whether you think there may be people pivoting to the Republicans as they look at some of the far left and some of the issues around immigration and such? Oh, I have no doubt that uh, many centrist Democrats would uh, immediately um, support uh, Nikki Haley uh, if she were to get the nomination. And I think if Trump is smart, he'll make Nikki Haley his vice president and, um, and, and use her as a way of trying to get increased support among um, independents and, and moderate Democrats. Uh, right now, tragically, this horrible war that's going on in the Middle East, you don't want to think about who it benefits and who it hurts. But at the moment, it seems to have helped uh, Biden. Um, he, you know, he showed strength by going over there in the middle of a crisis. Um, whatever you might think about the specifics of his policy, and there have been criticisms, he's shown himself um, uh, as, as, as a relatively uh, a strong leader, and I think it's enhanced his his credibility. But there's a long way between now and a year from now, and anything can change. This is an election that will be determined by the good Lord and how what help he gives the two candidates. Uh, right now, if the two candidates ran against each other right this minute, Biden, I was going to say Biden would win. Let me put it a little differently. Trump would lose. Neither neither candidate is going to get enthusiastic support. So yeah. Biden will lose, though. And right now, uh, Trump would lose. Um, a year from now, nobody can make that prediction. You know, it's, it is it is taking our eye and our attention off the domestic um you know, issues with regard to the trials that Trump is facing, right. New York Attorney General, such, that would seem to be something that potentially could hurt Trump, given that whenever each of these cases comes up, his poll numbers go up. Do you think that's the case? Well, I think it helps him in the Republican Party. It helps him, makes it more difficult for the candidates who are now vying for the Republican nomination to get airspace, airtime. Uh, and, and to run effectively against him. And Trump is smart not to be part of those debates. So he'll, he'll win the, the nomination unless something dramatic happens. And then between the nomination and the election, he'll probably be convicted in at least one or two of the cases. And then it'll be interesting to see, because I haven't seen any really good polling on that, even if you could have good polling, as to what a conviction would do uh, among centrist, moderate, independent voters. Where are you most likely to see a conviction? Obviously, we've seen cases where it's a fait accompli and they're deciding the punishment, but that's um, really on the civic side. Anything in particular yeah. that comes to mind? Well, I think he'll be convicted in the three areas where the jury pool is heavily biased against him, <clears throat> which is Washington, D.C., New York City, and Fulton County. Yeah. Um, maybe not in Palm Beach County. But there'll be definitely some convictions, I believe, and then some of that will be reversed on appeal. But the strategy by those who want to, quote, get Trump is to get the convictions before the election, have it influence the election, and then not be so concerned about whether it's reversed on appeal um, after the election. Let, let me cycle uh, full circle back to the genesis of this conversation on Israel. Um, you are currently working on a book about the um, anti-Semitism. What is, what is fueling this what rise in anti-Semitism that we're seeing? Um, it predates the situation of what's happening in Israel. Is there anything specifically you would point to that we should be keeping our eyes on? Yeah, college students and professors that are our future. <laughs> it's a horrible failure. 
whole university experience over the last 10 years has been an abject, abject failure. Um, schools have been turned into uh, propaganda machines. The hard left uh, silences um, uh, people. Uh, uh, you don't get uh, point, different points of view. Um, I've been away from Harvard for 10 years now. I can't, I can't come back to Harvard to make the case for Israel. Uh, one, one group invited me about three, four years ago, and they had to move the event off campus for fear that I would be physically uh, attacked on the Harvard campus after 50 years of teaching there. Uh, alternate points of view are today not accepted, and, and classrooms become propaganda mills where, where teachers separate out a Jewish student from the non-Jewish students and, and, and make fun of the Jewish students, where um, um, t teachers uh, glorify uh, Hamas. And even beyond the, the Israel issue, uh, so many other issues where it's just one-sided propaganda, where conservatives, centrists, even liberals, liberals are afraid to speak out because they will offend the, the woke um, and progressive uh, hard left intolerant Stalinist hard left. And that's what it is. It's reminiscent of Stalinism of the 1930s, except uh, it doesn't have the death penalty. But uh, as Heinrich Heine put it once, when you start by burning books, you'll end by burning people. And so I'm very afraid of what the future holds for America based on what university students are, are doing today. Uh, an example I just heard about today. So the head of the Student Bar Association at New York University Law School wrote a piece blaming everything on Israel while all these horrible things were going on. And so a law firm which represents clients said, no, we it withdrew its offer. Polk her. Davis, so, yeah. Yeah, we don't want our clients to be represented by, uh, you know, a Nazi. If you are in favor of lynching the blacks, we wouldn't hire you. If you're in favor of uh, shooting gays, we wouldn't hire you. And if you're in favor of beheading Jews, we're not going to hire you. I'm told that the majority of students at NYU Law School are on the side of this racist bigot and are against Winston Strawn, the law firm. I'm supporting Winston Strawn in any law firm. Uh, I'm also supporting naming every yeah. single student who signs these petitions. You cannot engage in such an immoral act and hide behind the organization. That's not doxing. That's not McCarthyism. That's holding you accountable. That's transparency. That's part of the marketplace of ideas. I want to know who it is that's making these arguments so I can look them up. I can find out what their history is, what their background is, and I can respond as such. Um, yeah. We should not be hiding the facts from, from well, the American people. Um, certainly more to discuss. And as always, thank you for joining us, um, Alan. And uh, yeah, our hearts go out we to everybody involved. Questions. Thank you. Yeah, you always ask the best questions. So I love being on your show. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I appreciate it.